My name's Simon Sankey, I work with Dairy NZ based at Lincoln, but brought up on the sheep and beef um, farm in Mid Canterbury. Um, and this is really much um, a chance to um, give the, our view around the government proposal compared with the Hewa Connected Partnership. Uh, and we wanted to hear some of your feedback and also give you some clarity. Um, joining us, we have from Beef and Lamb, um, George Tatum. Give us a wave, George. So people we, we are, um, um, farming in Eastern North Island. Um, also got Jim Vanderpoel, um, Waikato Dairy Farmer, um, Chair of Dairy NZ. Give us a wave. Um, thank you. Um, and also joining from Beef and Lamb, we've got um, Rowena Hugh. Give us a wave, Rowena. Okay, and we've also got Nick Tate from Dairy NZ as well. Give us a wave, Nick. Okay, can we, and behind the scenes, you always have a group here. We've got Dion and Laura who've been our DJs and they're gonna help us go through this. Can you do the next slide, please, um, Laura? Okay, so what we're here today is sort of sort of provide you um, the view on the government proposal. We had the Hiwaki you know, um, partnership that was we talked about in earlier this year. Many of you have been online with this. Um, so we're just wanting to give you clarity about where the, the views are and where we see the major differences are. So we're going to go through a background on the emission um, pricing um, and give, trying to give real clarity actually how the government proposal is different from the Hiwaki you know, partnership. Um, we're going to highlight some of those key areas and concern. Um, we've got a real long session because we, we know it's important to you as farmers, but the key areas concern from 1 to um, um, one to 125, um, those questions. And the last bit is actually George is going to give an overview of what the next steps are. And we're also going to be online for any other of those questions that actually um, haven't been answered. I would like, like to now just hand it over to Jim Vanderpoel, who's the Chair of Board of Dairy NZ of Waikato Dairy Farmer, just to give us a background in this emission pricing and sort of, Jim, how did we get here? Hey, Simon, thanks, Simon. Um, thanks for the introduction. And look, thanks everybody for taking the time to come and join. This is really important for us. And it's really important for us also that we kind of walk through with you um, how what the government have proposed is quite different to what we what the industry proposed um, and submitted in on the 31st of May this year. So we'll walk through as part of that. But up front, it's fair to say the more we've looked at it, the more we realise that it is fundamentally different. And uh, and so we you know we don't support some of the changes the government have made. We'll go through the detail of that. We want to up front and say we do not support those. And so we'll be able to actually get all that um, fixed as part of this consultation process. Um, I think it's worth noting that uh, we have managed to maintain the split gas approach, which is always important. And um, you know, it's, and that was a big win for the industry right back in 2019 when the Zero Carbon Act was um, was implemented. So, oh, 2018. So, if you look at the slide, so you can see we've been on this journey for a while now. I think the government have been trying to introduce some sort of uh, mechanism since about 2004. So, you know, that's this journey's been around for quite some time, and we've been on this journey for a while. And this is really, you know, when we engage with the government here, we're really trying to um, find a solution that we can, that we think is fair and acceptable, and um, and we believe will help us to play our part and uh, and do what's right. So, um, so yeah, so that you'll see if you look at the timelines here, um, we've, you know, we've been at this for a while, and you'll see the actual government, and I think it's worth, make, worth making the point that what government has come back with is not the hey, walk you can know proposal, you know, like it's quite fundamentally different. So we'll walk through that with you. But this is pretty much the timeline of um, how we've been tracking, really. So, uh, Lou, if you could have the next slide, please. Thanks, guys. So, uh, the, if, if just to remind everybody, too, you'll remember that the reason we got into this, the government legislated that agriculture would be in the ETS, that that legislation is actually, in fact, already in, in place. And, uh, and we we didn't agree with that. We strongly disagreed with that because we think that would be a, that's a very bad outcome for New Zealand and for de and for farmers generally, you know, and uh, and for the rural sector. So um, so we have been working on this as an alternative for some time now. And uh, but having said all that, we do we you know New Zealand has committed to the prime uh, to the Paris Accord, and you know, because we are such a big part of this, we will need to do our share. What we're trying to get trying to ensure is that what our share what our share was fair and equitable 
and that it doesn't um, undermine rural communities and viability of farmers and their businesses. So that's our objective here. But we've, um, yeah, but we've, yeah, we've committed to try and do what we can to try and get the right outcomes here. Thanks, Lloyd. Next slide. Okay, so if you look at this, there is, of course, we've always got to keep in mind, there is an expectation um, from our fellow New Zealanders that we do our share as part of this process, but also from our consumers and, and the people who buy our products, that New Zealand is um, part of the solution. And, um, and I think generally uh, we accept that, you know, we just want to make sure what our share is, is fair and equitable, really, and viable. So, um, but this is really, you know, this is really what sees, you know, some of our key um, people who buy our products really what their own um, what their own targets are and so they'll be looking for products that actually help them meet their own targets and we think we've got a good story to tell as part of that. Thanks Laura. So, so I just at a high level um, the cumulative changes of what the government have proposed really unsettles the balance um, and increases the actual um, impacts on sheep and beef and deer in particular. But when we've looked at the detail, they've also made some assumptions around dairy um, that are actually wrong. And so we believe under their proposal, the impact on dairying is more than what they're actually laying out as well. So uh, we'll go through some of that detail as part of this proposal. So all in all, you know, you'll see that the impacts that when you take the cumulative amount of all there, changes, it has quite a big impact on. We still do retain our farm level uh, split gas approach, which is good. Um, but I guess it's a, at a high level, the government proposal, what they need to change, I guess what they have changed, so we need to actually sort of get that back on track is things around governance and price setting, then how that money is utilised and allocated and the decision making around that's all part of that governance construct and the sequestration, what's in. We, we think it's only fair that if farmers are asked to pay for their um, admissions, you know, that they'll also then have the opportunity to be recognised anywhere where they're helping New Zealand actually meet uh, meet their targets as well. So we think that's only fair, you know, and they have put in, if they don't deliver uh, it on time, they've put in a backstop process of levy, whereas we, you know, we've said all along and our farmers gave us that good feedback uh, when we had that round of meetings early in the year, that farmers really want to have an on-farm levy and that's where we are as well. Um, and so we want to do everything we can to try and actually get to that and uh, and get that because then farmers have told us quite clearly they want to know what their own numbers is. And if they change their farming practices or improve their position, they want to be recognised for that. And so we we accept that that's, um, that's a great principle for us to work towards. Okay, and but also the government accountability for deliver delivery. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it, that as we go through as well. So thanks, Laura. So this is, you remember from the last time we talked to you guys, we gave you the first two columns, you know, around the New Zealand ETS and what we thought was good or bad. And then the Haywalking you know, proposal, what we proposed, you know, that's the second column. And, you know, it should be obvious, but red of course is bad, green is good, and yellow is somewhere in between. And so, but you'll see the proposal we put forward was fundamentally better than what the government, what, you know, then going into the ETS, the only one, of course, there is some administration costs involved. And um, and so we will, um, so that was really the only downside on what we were proposing, but everything else was better than what the government was proposing. If you then look at the government proposal at a high level, it's fundamentally different, not as bad as the ETS, but fundamentally worse than what um, the Hay Waka Kanawa, what we proposed in our submission in May. And so, uh, like I said, we will go through a lot of that to actually, as we're going through, but just at a high level, you know, as far as uh, administration goes, less there's less in government's proposal as they control the system, but there's still there's still some costs. The complexity still complex uh, to report emissions incentives and sequestration under fit for purpose. You know, it, it does it address and reward emissions. You know, not enough, not as much as our proposal, and uh, and also the offsets. And then around choice, it removes farmers' choice around options on farm. Um, and then as far as control, there's quite a bit less control um, of the direction because it's really the government who really make the key decisions. And, it, and we think that's not really in the spirit of the partnership, you know, because it's really, you know, what we propose is we would do it in, in consultation with government or government with us. But now it's really the ministers and the commission, the Climate Change Commission will make that decision. So we don't, 
um, farmers were quite clear with us that that they wanted their industry uh, representatives and leaders to be part of that process. Um, sequestration, the government has limited the ability to offset impact on profitability, of course, so that we see that that then of course proposes that um, it links, you know, some aspects of it to the New Zealand ETS and the price setting, and therefore it's a lot, uh, if you add those things together, it becomes a lot worse than what the partnership proposed. And then also future investment, you know, like um, we think that, you know, that the government, I am, the government controls that, and then they have some, um, you know, then they make the decision about where that's gone, and they're also proposing how that money is used, which we'll talk about, that was not part of what we proposed and uh, so some of their proposals about how some of that money is spent is um, you know is not what we support or what we what we um, what we promoted when we put our proposal forward the government does though um, continue to recognize the split gas approach so that's, that's so that's a good thing so uh, thank you thank you Laura and thank you for All that right. Jim so look, that gives us a great segue into an overview, but it gives us a great segue, as you said, Jim, the devil's in the detail. Um, and that's Correct. what, yep. and I think that's what but this next bit is actually, let's dig down to some of that clarity and actually what does some of these details actually mean and the impact we have. So look, I'll, um, I'll hand over to Rowena, but before we do that, can I just, um, for the people who have just come on, um, we're trying to use Slido, um, S-L-I-D-O, you can use it on your phone or on, uh, um, on your website as such to answer questions. And if you look down the chat, um, there's actually the chat button on Zoom, it's got the code there, which is 57462266. So if you get a crack to put into Slido with your phone as such, that'd be really appreciated. Um, if you don't, could you just use the chat for some of your answers as we come through? And do ask questions as we go through and do vote for the ones you think shivers. We need to get that one answered first because that's really important to me as a farmer. So look, I'll hand it over to Rona Hume, um, GM from Beef and Lamb, to sort of, let's get into some of that detail, Rowena. Thanks, Simon. So first um, up, I'm going to just take you through at a high level, um, the framework of the model that we were trying to achieve and how it's different. And then the next section will drill into each of those kind of differences in more detail. So next slide, please. First up, we're going to start um, with a bit of a discussion around the modelling, because I know there's been a lot of focus on that. And what the government's modelling has done, and, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the questions we've got about the modelling um, in the next slide, but on, in this slide, you know, what the modelling shows is that at a, um, a, an eight cent methane price and linking the nitrous oxide price to the ETS, um, we, this, they expect that we will exceed the methane target in 2030. The methane target is 10% by 2030, and their modeling indicates that we could reduce methane emissions with that eight cent price, a relatively low price um, um, by 3% would be a 13% reduction in methane. So um, I guess what the modeling is validated, you know, there was criticisms about the Haywalker Kinoa proposal from, um, from, from a lot of NGOs saying this is um, greenwashing. What this shows is that the price, um, putting price on agriculture has significant implications and we need to take a really cautious approach. And I think the government's sort of taken that on board to some extent with this modeling and they're talking about lower prices. But what we see with the changes that they've made is that those impacts are still um, much higher um, than they need to be. And they're also, um, because of the changes they've made, impacting more on sheep, beef, and, and deer sector um, inequitably. Um, and that's okay, not okay. So here you see here um, the net revenue um, estimates by the government, a 6% reduction in dairy, 18% reduction in net revenue for sheep and beef, 1% um, reduction in, in deer production, negative 4 for dairy, negative 16 for sheep, an 8% increase for beef, and I'll explain a bit about that um, outcome in a minute, and 13% for deer. So... Um, you know, the, the, what's important to understand, or I guess, around some of these figures is that look, they're looking at a sector level and not at the individual farm level. And what's going on around those numbers as well, like with the net revenue number, is that um, particularly for sheep and beef includes um, their expectations of farms leaving the sector as a result of the afforestation um, and the ETS price that's driving a lot of farms to be sold into forestry, as well as the farm level impacts of the price. Um, and the, we estimated about an 8%, 8 cent methane price that you could have about a 10% average reduction in um, sheep and beef um, revenue at the farm level. But then within that, there's a lot of variation 
um, of impacts and, and and for some of the less profitable you know guys that could have exacerbate that that leaving of the sector and so I think that's why they're kind of getting that higher number for the um, industry they're combining afforestation and the impact of the price which is exacerbated significantly by taking out the sequestration that they did because our sector is is quite price sensitive going on to the next slide there's some other things as well around the estimates um, as well that are going on there that we've got questions about. You saw that there was very low impacts on the dairy sector, for example, and um, the reason for that, I think, is that they are making some quite heroic assumptions in there around, I think, 100% uptake of technologies that may or may not be available, which means that the dairy sector are able to use those technologies and pay less or, or get incentive payments, but that's highly highly um, subject, you know, that's probably not realistic. And there's also quite, um, um, and see, these assumptions built into the dairy modeling as well around receiving much higher prices for um, the, the product as a result of the pricing sort of mechanism as well. So I guess um, what we'd say about the modeling is there's always, um, you know, ways of interpreting and, and it's a sort of a, just a guide, but it does show significant impacts, you know, for, for the sheep and beef sector of this because of the, particularly because of the sequestration and probably underestimates the impact um, on the dairy sector. Next slide, please. So in terms of what we were trying to achieve with Haywalker Ekinoa um, to begin with, these were our four priorities. We wanted to have greater choice and control and a split gas approach with a separate price for methane and for nitrous oxide. Um, we wanted to recognise a much greater range of on-farm vegetation for farmers, um, genuinely sequestering carbon um, that they get recognised it for. And we wanted the revenue that was raised from the system to be recycled back. And on choice and control, carbon sequestration and agricultural investment, those, all those three areas have been quite significantly changed and we'll explain that in a bit more detail. Next slide, please. So what was our original kind of concept? The, what we were looking at was um, something that probably people have heard before. We call it A plus B minus I minus C. So farmers paid, um, faced a unique price for their methane and a unique price for their um, long, for the nitrous oxide. Um, and they paid a levy based on that, but within a calculator, you know, um, farmers were then also able to net off within that calculator um, if they were doing um, using new technologies or using um, farming practices that reduced um, emissions, they could get a um, takeoff money within that calculator for that and take off money for their sequestration. And it was all within a closed system that was designed to only raise enough money through the levy, through the price to fund those other things. Um, and it was a circular system. Um, so that was what we we were proposing, A plus B minus I minus C, all within one calculator. Could you just go on to the next slide, please? And our proposal was very much um, not focused on price. We've been very strong from the start that um, price should not be the primary driver of of the emissions reduction. We have not seen it work with the ETS um, and um, what happens with the price is you just drive some of the more least profitable um, systems out of, out of um, business. And the way that we created our system was that there was a price, but it was a marginal price. And the focus was more on incentivizing farmers to use the new technologies as became available or doing things on their farms that would reduce their emissions and they would get incentivized and payments back for doing that. And so it was really get around that incentive payment, but also recognizing um, within the system, building an equity for um, those more extensive farming systems that may not have um, the same access to tools that they were able to get recognition for their sequestration because it's mainly the more extensive farms that have a lot more of that that are likely to have the fewer tools. Um, so it was really kind of focused around uh, raising enough money to do that sort of thing. Next slide, please. And this is kind of how we see, I guess, the way that the government's changed it at that high level. It's created an imbalance, you see, with the um, thing there that the focus is far more on the price 
um, they've done that through, um, and we'll get into more detail in a minute, but with the methane price, yes, we've got a split gas price. Yes, the price is lower, but they've reduced the criteria around that to, to really give it to the Climate Change Commission and to have more focus on just achieving the methane targets rather than taking into account all the other things that we said needed to be taken into account when setting the price, such as um, emissions leakage, um, profitability and equity within the sector and um, availability of technology. They've just, the price, you know, setting will be driven by the Climate Change Commission and they'll be, their main focus is on meeting the target. In terms of the long-lived gases, we wanted to have a unique price for nitrous oxide and they've now linked that to the ETS. And we don't think that that makes sense and we'll go into more detail on that later because, you know, um, even the Climate Change Commission has quite different objectives for the reduction of nitrous oxide compared to CO2 because um, it's recognized that there's a biological link between nitrous oxide and methane. Um, so if you put the pressure too much on nitrous oxide, that will then, you know, if that impacts on your profitability, if the um, ETS price is going up rapidly, that's going to have an impact on the overall farming business. Um, and particularly if you're not expecting to reduce nitrous oxide by the same amount. The other, um, so that's on the levy, the cost side of things. They've done things that are going to increase the cost. And then on the on the um, offset side that would have recycled things back, um, they've done, they've taken, we believe, they've broken the link. We're having one in one calculator, one system where a farmer could easily work this out. The way the government's proposals are working is that um, incentives you'd have to apply for a rebate. Um, and you would, um, it would be for a more limited number of things of use of technology, not the on-farm practices. And for sequestration, it would not be in a calculator anymore. It would be a separate contract management system, um, which we believe would be a barrier to farmers. We got that feedback during our consultation. Um, and also for a far limited amount of vegetation. And we'll go into much more detail about that, but it just really has unbalanced the system. Next slide, please. So yeah, summing it up, um, ultimately we see it as a much more unbalanced system, particularly driven by the removal of the recognition of sequestration, methane price driven by legislated targets, um, and the nitrous oxide price as well linked in with the ETS price, and other things that they've got sort of in that finer detail that really kind of chip away at what we were trying to sort of achieve um, through our original proposal. And therefore, it has much more of an impact on production and profitability um, than, um, than what we would be expecting and looking for, and therefore unacceptable. Next slide. So some of the changes that we are looking for to rebalance that system, we want to have more of a role in the um, price setting, and Nick will go into that more detail. I haven't mentioned that sort of much yet, but we were looking to have a sector involvement in that price setting process as well. Um, we want a greater criteria for the methane price setting, um, and we want the um, nitrous oxide price delinked. We want the recognition of sequestration that we'd proposed that would have significant implications for sheep and beef farmers and deer farmers and removal of the processor levy backstop, which I haven't, um, which Jim mentioned and Nick will go into in more detail in a minute. Over to you, Nick. Yeah, just before you do that, Rowena, we had one question that was a point of clarification around um, undermines the equity of the system. We talked about that right at start. We've answered in the slide, but I'm sure not everybody's got that. Just want to expand just the equity, undermines the equity of the system. Yeah. So um, the way that we had been looking at the system and we'd been a huge priority for, for beef and lamb when we were creating this system because we knew that our sector was a lot more price sensitive um, was to get proper recognition for the sequestration on our farms. And there's an estimate of about 1.4 million hectares of native vegetation on sheep and beef farms. And farmers have really struggled to get that into the ETS. And so the sequestration that um, categories and criteria that we had set out um, would have allowed farmers to get a lot more recognition of their post-1990 vegetation, a simpler system for them there, much more flexible for smaller blocks and non wiggly blocks that um, and for pre-1990 sequestration and for shelter bounce and from Piperian, it all added up to quite a significant opportunity 
for quite a lot of our sheep and beef farmers to offset the costs of, of the price of A and B. So it created, um, and our extensive sheep and beef farmers have a lot more of that sequestration, less ability to, to use the technologies in the future. So that was a, a way of kind of creating equity in the system. Okay, no, thank you for that, Rona. And thank you for the question that put it on Slido, and hopefully that's answered that question. Um, look, and if, yeah. if anyone wants to kind of look into it more detail, maybe Dion could put it in. We did a modeling report um, at the time that the Haywaka Kinawa proposal came out that showed a bit of our modeling around the sequestration coverage and what farmers could have done and how it could have offset the cost to show how important that was. Okay, no, thank you for that, Verena. And also for the people that just joined, um, do go down to chat if you can get on the slider. I know for some of you, if you just use your phone or the, your server and your computer, if not, just put them in the chat and we'll bring some of those questions across. Look, I'll now um, bring in Nick Tate, who's a lead advisor for Dairy NZ. Um, can you drill it down a wee bit more still, Nick? Yeah, thank you, Simon. And and look, the, just re reiterating that point, that equity thing is a huge part of the proposal and how we managed to get everybody to agree to a pathway forward. So there's a huge fundamental pillar of what we proposed back in May. And that is the the unbalancing that we're seeing will, will drive uh, the inequity amongst our agriculture sector. And then, um, and the only way that we see a pathway through this is to remain together and actually um, support each other through this because it is the government that is pricing agricultural emissions. We're trying to provide a pathway that, that is not only scientifically robust, but has uh, is equitable amongst the whole agriculture sector because every part of it's important to New Zealand's future. So I just wanna drill down now into kind of the next layer. And, and through this session, what we're going to do is, is uh, get your feedback and ask some questions to you. We're trying to make them simple questions for you to ask. So please, if you want to, to elaborate anything further, please put that in the chat as well, and we'll get to it at the end. But the real part of this is to, to get your to get farmers feedback. And that does two things, right? It, it helps you understand the fundamental differences between what the partnership proposed and what the government proposes, but it also allows us to, uh, to add a bit of depth and weight and farmer feedback into our submission to the government because um, submissions to the government are going to be very important through this next period, um, not just from us, but from farmers as well. So hopefully what we can do here is help you start thinking about the differences and then maybe if you would like to put a submission in yourself, we would fully support that. So next slide, please, Laurie. So when we drill down into the, the next level of detail, there are th seven real er key areas that we are, we are significantly concerned with, right? And all of these, and as the team before me has kind of said, these cumulative changes add up to a fundamental shift. So a lot of little areas mean that we lose all of those pillars that kind of Rowena talked about in terms of choice control, sequestration, split gas approach, and revenue recycling. The first one I want to delve into is kind of, um, next slide please, is the governance area. And this was really important in the partnership, right? So what we proposed originally in Hewaka Ikanoa was that there would be a system oversight board with sector representation at the heart of it. And they would work alongside ministers to set the strategy and price and, and overall revenue recycling to make sure that it was a, a, a circular system as kind of Roe pointed out earlier on. Uh, and, and ministers were in policy had to um, follow enhanced collaboration with the board for all of those components. So it was designed for us to have a say and a seat at the table. Has the government changed from that? So they've moved from an enhanced collaboration model to more consultation. Ministers would uh, appoint individuals into that body instead of farmers being able to do that. And they would only consult with that advisory board on the use of revenue. So we wouldn't get much of a say in terms of the levy price or the strategy or the overall kind of direction of the whole program. And then in terms of the, the doing part, the implementation agency that would obviously administer the program, they would report directly to the ministers. And we propose that they should report to the system oversight board. So quite a different fundamental shift where ministers control a lot of the power uh, and, and the direction of prices and strategy. Uh, and we have less of a say as a, as a sector. So next slide, please. So in terms of our thoughts, we think that gut farmers in this system should be more than just consulted with in price setting, right? 
and they must consider our views and advice and input into how the system is run, right? And, and farmers should have direct control and say of the use of the levy, levy that's sorry levy that's raised and, and revenue that's raised and how it's spent back into the sector. Um, and and as Ro has pointed out, and I'll talk a wee bit more. When you start tying individual aspects to the NZDTS, that money goes into a consolidated fund that they choose to spend in other areas of the economy. So effectively, we would be subsidising other areas. And we and that goes against the kind of principle of revenue recycling that we put forward. And even when the Prime Minister announced this, she talked about the benefits of revenue recycling, which tells me she hadn't read the detail around how the proposal would not fully recycle the revenue, right? So the second big area for us in terms of uh, key, key things that we need to, to, to talk about is the role of sequestration. And, and Ro and... Um, and Jim have talked about this already. So what did the partnership recommend? So we recommended that uh, on farm, you should be able to recognize additional, so that meets a criteria around actually storing carbon, um, on farm sequestration from a wide range of permanent and cyclical forms of vegetation, including indigenous, uh, including um, riparian areas, including uh, shelter belts and tree lots, and, and, and as much as we could genuinely recognised, okay? Um, it was about seven categories. Obviously, if there were pine trees that were eligible for the, or exotics that were ex uh, eligible for the NZETS, then that's probably the place to put them because we didn't want to create two different systems. And how will we implement that? From 2025, we proposed a simple system um, to recognise existing programmes or trees that are existing programmes, and then a much more detailed integration in 2027 with backdating to recognise back to 2025 uh, on-farm sequestration that meet the categories of Hewaka Ikenawa. So what has the government proposed and what have they come out with? Well, they have kind of taken to this area with a, with a big knife, right? So it has to still be additional, but it's only two, two categories now, and that is riparian margins planted after 2008 and active management of native vegetation. So your indigenous vegetation on-farm, Active management means that you do things like pest control and um, and fencing and um, stock exclusion and things like that. And you would only get recognition in that category for the sequestration that was associated with that activity. So it was a very low amount of recognition for and missing all the potential other things going on in that native vegetation. So if you did pest control and, and fencing and things like that, uh, you would only get the recognition for the, the benefit that that gave to that indigenous forest. So effectively, very low amounts of recognition of sequestration on farm. In the long term, the government is talking about integrating this into the ETS and changing the ETS to recognise this, but uh, we haven't seen any plan or timeline for this. They've just said that in the long term, that could probably happen. Um, we would like to see some sort of timeline and we know that the changes that have happened already in the NZETS have been slow to, um, to happen and change. Uh, and so we are worried that that is kind of a, a long-term thing that they have no plan or timeline for. Also, the government proposes that this would be administered through sequestration management contracts that you would have to apply to the government after the cost of AMB. So what are our thoughts? Um, our thoughts is this is the key change that unbalances the government proposal. And farmers have less control over their emissions costs through reduced offsetting. And this particularly talks to our dry stock sector, our sheep, beef and deer sector, right? And the government should go back and have another look and adopt the partnerships recommendations and recognise more on-farm categories. And it should be in held accountable for the completed of this work if the intention is, the long-term intention is the NZETS. So the third big area of concern for us is, is how the prices are set. And this is for both methane and nitrous oxide. And I'll talk to methane to start off with, obviously. So what we uh, proposed in, the, in Heiwaki Ikenawa was that the price would be set by ministers as, as a legislated kind of pathway, but that will come from advice from the system oversight body, the body that has sector representation that sits at the heart of the proposal, right? And would follow a broader set of pricing criteria. And that includes socio-economic impacts on, on regions and, and production and profitability, 
uh, the avail availability of technology to reduce emissions, uh, potential emissions leakage, and that is the what comes from if we reduce production in one area, does somewhere else in the world pick up that production? And alongside those environmental objectives of reducing emissions and water quality and biodiversity and things like that, right? So how has that fundamentally shifted from what the government has proposed uh, last week? And they have moved to an approach which bases the, the price of methane solely on the targets and legislation. So that methane target, that's all they care about. They don't care about any of the other the impacts, right? And the price would be set by ministers on advice from the Climate Change Commission. So we as a sector and, and as a voice of farmers, we get relegated out of the discussion of this and the Climate Change Commission comes in as technically experts to give their voice, right? And they are talking and they are consulting on whether the price should be set annually or every three years. Um, we think that's kind of a moot point. It's more about how the price is set, right? Next slide, please. In terms of nitrous oxide, and, and Rowena's has talked to this a wee bit, what we proposed is similar to methane. The price would be set by ministers on advice from the uh, sector oversight body, which, could, which had farmer and, and industry body representation, right? And it would initially be set at a level to, to fund the necessary expenditure within the program. So think about that, that revenue neutral circle that kind of Rowena talked about. And that was primarily to fund sequestration, but also would have somewhat a, a play in, in alongside methane and funding incentives, research and development and administration. And what we said is we would review this strategy in 2028 to see our pathway towards uh, nitrous oxide remission, um, reductions and what we needed to do there. So, and that strategy would be done by the system oversight body. The government, once again, has departed quite significantly in this area. And what they're saying is the price will be linked to the NZETS market at a discount, okay? So not set by ministers or, or advice or anything like that. It would be linked to the carbon market, the NZETS, okay? And that discount is, is free allocation. So what you receive for free. So uh, if you want to think about that free allocation, it's kind of like a, a proportion of it will be given to free for to us because of the, the ability to reduce emissions. But that free allocation has been indicated to be reduced over time. And what does that actually mean? That, that uh, there'd be more pressure on the price to go upwards over time because that NZETS price is predicted to go into the hundreds of dollars in the future, right? And the removal of free allocation means we're exposed to more of it. So it continues that the price would only go in one direction. So what are our thoughts around price setting? And this speaks to both methane and nitrous oxide, right? So the price of methane should be guided by a wider set of criteria, not just the trajectory towards targets. It should think about all of those other things that I talked about. And it should only collect enough levy to deliver on the scheme's intended purposes and outcomes. That revenue recycling is hugely important. The price of nitrous oxide should not be linked to the NZETS. And it should be uh, set every three years to provide certainty and stability to the sector so that we're not jumping around because there could be a change in government or things like that. And the removal of free allocation for nitrous oxide emissions should, account, uh, should take account for its role in the production of food. Um, we need the, the government to think more and broadly about how to price um, emissions, ag agriculture emissions, than just blunt instruments like the NZETS or uh, the advice of the Climate Change Commission and, and Minister. So the fourth big area for us is how the levy is re, re, um, used. Obviously, there's going to be some levy raised in terms of A and B, and, and how it's used is what we proposed in the partnership back in, uh, in May is that the revenue raised would fund sequestration incentives, research and development and administration of the system. So it'd be a closed system, okay? And that would be administered by the sector over system oversight board with industry representation. And it would be exclusively used for the agriculture sector. It would not go outside. So how does the government proposal differ from that? Uh, in terms of how we have input into that, we only have advice to the minister on the use of revenue and you as we've talked about with parts being integrated into the NZETS that would go outside of agriculture and go into the government's consolidated fund so we would have to look at how we got that back in the in the government's proposal 
but the, also because of the unbalanced system where A and B is not tied to I and C um, in, this, in the government proposal, uh, they have modelled that there would be an excess revenue generated. And by 2030, that could be somewhere in the realm of 100 to $140 million per annum. So, um, so A and B is significantly bigger than I and C and you're creating excess revenue. And, and, and in the discussion document that the government's come out with, they've, they've signaled that there could be potential use for the surplus revenue. And the two things that are, that are primarily targeted in terms of what they say is that they could use offshore, for offshore abatement if targets are not met. And that, by what I'm, in terms of policy language, offshore abatement means buying international carbon credits uh, to, to reduce, uh, to offset what our, our target might be, right? So funneling money overseas. And also to pay back the SURF fund. So the SURF fund is the Climate Emergency Response Fund. And in this, in budget 2022, they indicated 330 odd million dollars to help agriculture transition to a lower carbon economy. What they've potentially said is when there is a surplus that could pay back that SURF fund back to the government coffers. So, so there's some things around revenue recycling that although the government makes the noise that it's still a thing, there's some things in the detail that concern us, right? So in terms of what we think, the system shouldn't create a surplus and it should reinvest all of the revenue back into the agriculture sector, right? Um, this, and the sector should have some say in how that reinvestment and, and the, uh, um, is made and, and what that farm level levy is so that it doesn't create a surplus. So the government should adopt the following principles going forward, that revenue is exclusively invested into the agriculture sector, and ministers should set the price that it only collects enough revenue uh, levy to deliver the system outcomes and purposes. It should not deliver a surplus. So the fifth big area for us is um, government delivery, right? So. Um, what we recommended as the partnership is that we should have a simple farm level system implemented in 2025 with responsibility for delivery with the government with industry support and a fit for purpose detailed system implemented by 2027. What the government has, uh, has come away and said in the last week is that um, they agree a, far a simple farm level system implemented in 2025, but if the government can't deliver that, then they're proposing a new backstop op option, and that is a split gas processor level levy from the 1st of January 2025. They're also proposing that they make the decisions about when they move, if that's an option, if they move to that next year, and they're proposing that the revenue generated from that processor level levy would be um, used to fund the build of the farm level levy. So in a processor level levy, it would be based at your um, silver food farms or Fonterra or open country dairies or one of those sort of places. And it would be based on national emission factors to calculate your on-farm emissions. So you get no recognition for the, the things you did on-farm to reduce emissions. It would just be charged at a level that uh, would obviously then flow through to a reduced meat or milk check, right? They've also said no time frame for delivering a, a detailed system that would be fit for purpose and recognise on-farm change. So um, we would surmise that there's a couple of issues with that, right? And our thoughts uh, around that, that the, the system should go to the farm level in one step and not through an interim processes step. A and the government's kind of scored an old, own goal with this, i.e. it can't implement it, what it wants to do, so it proposes a process of backstop uh, levy. Um, and, uh, and and that pro provides for two systems, so it will become costly in terms of setup. And the government should be count held into account for the implementation. And uh, they, when the government set up the NZETS, it paid for that and, and cost shared over time, right? And if they want to set up this system as well, there should be some sort of sharing of costs, okay? And um, farmers, uh, we heard from, from in consultation, Farmers want a detailed system over time. Obviously, we understand that it's going to take some time to, to build and implement, but if farmers want to get recognition for the changes that they make on farm to reduce emissions, then that should come from a detailed system. And we need some sort of time frame around when that will be implemented from the government. And so two areas left, and this is around fertilizer emissions. And what we said as part of Hiwaki Kanoa and our partnership recommendations is that 
all on farm emissions would be accounted for and priced within the farm level split gas system, okay? What the government is proposing is, is slightly different, right? And that is synthetic fertilizer could be priced within that farm level system, or it could be priced within uh, the NZETS at a manufacturer or importer level. So um, once again, the reason uh, that we have some issue with that is uh, twofold, right? The loss of choice and control of farmers. If it's priced within a farm level split gas system, then the changes that you make on farm would be recognized and it wouldn't be, uh, and any reduction or, or improved use, I guess, could be could reduce your emissions. If it's priced at an ETS level through importer or manufacturer, that would just be a direct cost on the, the incoming price of fertilizer. And we already know how expensive that is, right? And also remember the things around the NZETS would have increased in price over time and the removal of free allocation. So the price would increase significantly as we get towards 2030 and onwards. So there's a loss of control there that we're concerned about. And so the last key area of concern for us is, is around collectives, right? And the partnership back in May recommended that all farms can form and enter collectives from 2025. And collectives would work together to report emissions and reduce or potentially offset emissions. So it was really important for Māori agribusiness and Māori farms, for processes potentially that wanted to form pro, um, collectives for their suppliers, catchment groups potentially, and farming systems and, and enterprises with multiple farms, as there's many of them across New Zealand as well. So it, it lessened the administrative, administrative burden because you would report everything under one umbrella, but it also allowed the opportunity to be able to look at potential offsets or reductions across multiple farm systems and businesses. The government's come back in, in the last week and said that, uh, and it's changed that quite a bit, right? So it said that only from by 2025, only Māori farms can can form and enter collectives and other farmers might be able to form uh, collectives at a later date. But they've given no specifics around this and no timeline for this. I've just said that potentially in the future, right? And we think that's a problem. We think there should be a, a fair system where farms can all enter collectives to choose how to report, reduce or offset emissions um, and, and work together because uh, as a collaborative approach, it's quite, it could be quite beneficial. So what we're going to do now to about you know, 25 past, we've actually got a sort of full board of questions that have sort of um, popped up um, and there's a mixture of technical governance questions and, and we'll go through. Um, so with that as well, can um, like Rowena, there's one that's been highlighted to you right at the start. Um, it's uh, had the top votes for a while in Slido and it was basically, yeah, so would the 1.4 million hectares of vegetation being included under the original he, um, Hiwaka Ekenaua plan? And it's not now. Um, is there any potential for government to change ETS to allow it? Yeah, really good question. Quite a complicated one to unpick. Yes. So a lot of that 1.4 million would have been covered under the original proposal because we were proposing to include post-1990, which technically is already in the ETS, but a lot of farmers have found it quite a, a burden to join into the ETS, either because they've got small blocks that don't make it worthwhile to enter into the ETS for the admin that's kind of available, or the blocks of, they've got lots of little blocks and they're not in the right size to get into the ETS. So what we proposed was a simpler system than for that post-1990, which would have meant a lot more of what you've got that's newer could have got recognition. And then what we were proposing, um, which is, has been picked up by the government, is that pre-1990 would all be covered, but you'd only get your additionality kind of payment for it. And that's the bit that the government has gone for. But because that additionality is, is a small part of the total sequestration, you're only getting... An, you're only getting recognised for the increase in sequestration that you've achieved from taking management activities that increase that sequestration above its BAU. And so it's a small amount. And what's really concerning in the consultation documents is the estimates they used for what that payment could be or how much sequestration could get recognised was tiny. It was like 0 0.5 tonnes. Um, per hectare, which is kind of makes it worth nothing. So they've reduced. So, and what we had is we had that going into the calculator and it was a simple system that it was kind of like your costs and your benefits all done in one. Um, so what the government has done is they've chosen two areas 
that they think could go into the ETS in the future out of all of those kind of categories and said, we'll kind of give you some money around that, but the idea is to kind of get those into the ETS in the future. But, um, and that, um, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, we do want the ETS to be improved. I want to make that clear because we do want to, um, we want to have a system for farmers to get better recognition for their sequestration, but over time we want to improve the ETS and encourage farmers to go over here so that they're getting money from um, from all taxpayers to pay for that. But we know that uh, oh, there will be a residual amount of sequestration that happens on farms that um, for various reasons you're not going to be able to get into the ETS. You either don't want to go through the base problems or you don't want to have to go through all the admin or you don't want to have to, um, uh, you know, your size of blocks don't match. Um, so there is potential to improve the ETS a bit for those two categories that I've said. They haven't said anything about the post-1990 stuff that we know is not working um, and how they could improve that criteria, make it easier for farmers. There's nothing around that. And there's no timelines around when they could get those two categories that they've still included into the ETS um, in the future as well. Um, and what they've told us about the categories that aren't that they haven't taken forward, so shelter belts, um, scattered woodlots and those sorts of things. What we'd had been indicated to us um, in the past was that those probably would never get into the ETS um, and that's probably why they haven't picked up those criteria, but those things add up to quite a lot on some farms with those shelter belts on some extensive farms. You know, there's thousands of trees that go in into those shelter belts. Um, so just just with that, um, we have got a just sort of a clarification question there. Um, how do we actually measure this additionality that sort of um, popped up? Yeah, I mean, the difficulty we've got with um, native vegetation is not there's not been much um, research done around it, and that's something we've been pushing for. And the government has said it's going to do more research, but it takes years. But um, there isn't very accurate. We used um, one study for the Haywalker Ekenawa program that suggested the sequestration rate could be about 1.8 um, tons of sequestration per hectare. Um, and the government's kind of modeling that they use, they use 0 0.5. Okay, so, so quite a disconnect. <laughs> quite a disconnect. Okay, no, thank you for that. Um, there's one that's popped up, and I might, there's almost um, that top one. Why aren't we arguing the most sustainable food producer globally um, implement proposals against the Paris Accords? So I think Jim or George, it's sort of, um, you've heard this question a few times. Mm -hmm. No, I'll start anyway, and if George wants to add anything, he's most welcome, you know, but I think where well, we do actually argue that, you know, and so that's why we don't. We don't support a, any proposal where we're exporting our production offshore because that would be bad for New Zealand and bad for, for the globe, actually. So, um, you know, I think what if you look at the Hawaki Kanoa um, assumptions we made, you know, farmers are already facing quite a few headwinds around other areas that will potentially impact their farming systems going forward. And so we were trying to make sure that Hawaki Kanoa didn't add to that. You know, what like the job here is to... Um, reduce our admissions and play our part as part of New Zealand's commitment to the Paris Accord, but not export our production. So we do argue that is the simple answer. George, have you got anything to add? Yeah, no, all just following on for that. That was one of our key criteria around the, the setting of the price of methane, that there wasn't emissions leakage uh, from that, which kind of speaks to that point exactly. Um, and, you know, I suppose a, a key point is, you know, that, um, you know, we are responding to the government wanting to do this rather than agreeing. No, no, thank you. Um, oh, one that's just popped up the top there that seems obviously behind the scenes. Um, yeah, what did the original um, modelling show regarding liquids in the Hiwaki Noa um, proposed partnership proposal? Rowena, Nick? Yeah, there was some modelling done um, and it did show leakage for I think particularly sheep and dairy um, sectors um, so not quite on the scale I think as it's shown for sheep in the government's one but that's an area that we're sort of looking at their leakage um, stuff a little bit more Nick do you want to yeah yeah you're right there's some modeling done um, to show the impact and and the reason we did that modeling is because that was part of the criteria as George pointed out in terms of price setting for methane, right? That uh, we were trying to minimize leakage. Uh, and that report kind of said that there would be a little bit and that would obviously influence the price. 
and and obviously, as I said before, the government's gone away from that criteria for methane price setting uh, and removed that com that um, criteria around emissions leakage. Okay, um, we'll cover, cover one there, one down below there. That actually could cover you on a technical thing point of view is: um, Does grass ever get included in sequestration? Um, Nick and Roe, just um, yeah. you... I'll I'll take this one. Yeah, um, and Dr. Jacqueline Roweth is on the call, so if uh, I'll try and butcher her more professional job of uh, explaining this question. Um, and we've done a video on that as well, which should be on our website. So if you want to go and have a look at that as well, it'll be good. The, the key thing is, um, is the concept of additionality, right? So when you're looking at sequestration, it must uh, capture and store carbon for a period of time. Grass isn't so much of a, a sequester as it's more of a converter. And, and the way to think about it is that your average cover on farm this year, um, at this date and this time, is probably in the ballpark to what it was at this time last year, right? So you're not actually sequestering, you're converting. And you convert it through and ruminant animal generally into products such as milk and meat. And, and that is expired out as CO2 as well. So it's it's assumed in kind of, it's part of this the carbon cycle. It's not actually sequestration, it's more conversion. Okay, Nick, and no, no doubt Jacqueline will give you a mark afterwards after this. Okay, with that, um, look, carrying on some technical question, it relates to, relates to your first question, Rowena. The, the next one up the top is, what is um, Hiwaka Kanoa's approach plan for delineating on-farm vegetation, particularly yeah. native, um, native um, and have we got expertise to do this on the scale, scale required? Yep. Yeah, so... Um... We have been looking into ways that can be done. We think that the technology is there. There is incredibly detailed geospatial satellite imagery now that allows you to get right down to the tree level on farms um, to, to see what's there. Mm -hmm. So the, the ETS is based on rules of um, one hectare minimum. And that's because that's based on an international agreement back in 1999, 1990. And that was the kind of accuracy of satellite imagery then was one hectare. It's sort of just based on a historical point of time rule. And that's what the ETS says. You have to have a minimum of one hectare. We were saying a minimum of 0 0.25 hectares because so not individual farm and individual tree level but small blocks and there's really good um, satellite imagery for that around and we've been um, looking at companies that can do that and there's a company called carbon crop that's using some of that imagery and doing a lot of work with farmers at the moment um, and we've and, if, and understand that that's um, been a really simple system yeah so there is the technology out there we don't think it's complicated and we think it could be implemented pretty simply no, mate. Thanks for that, Ro. Um, the next question, and I'll thank you, Sally, for the question here is, um, yeah, are the levy bodies confident in individual farm levels in place by the 1st of um, January um, 2025? I think this might be a governance question, Jim or George, or is it a technical question for Ro and Nick? Well, it may be a little bit of both, Simon, but I think there is some, uh, um, I think when we looked at it as part of Hey Waka Kano, there was some risk around it. There wasn't any reason why it couldn't be done. There's just some risk around whether it would actually get delivered. And so it's probably the simplest way of actually um, explaining it. From, 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 I think from my side, Simon, um, I think from our side, as in the levy bodies, I think we can provide a system. And we have said that it, it, to start with, it will be a, a fairly simple system that we can provide the information required um, to do it. But the question mark is whether the government would have a system that could receive our data. Uh, and that's where, you know, we, we believe uh, the onus is on them. If we can provide the data, then they should build a system that can receive it. Um, but that is definitely where the question mark lies around whether we could, yep. uh, the full system is ready. Okay. And I'd just add to that, that we've had, you know, we've been doing the GHG workshops this year and we've gone from you know in the last year and a half and we've we've gone from you know virtually no farmers knowing their number to sheep and beef farmers anyway to you know nearly 70 percent now through using that calculator so people are already, and i know dairy farmers have already got these through Fonterra and the, the dairy company so there's already a lot of kind of i guess knowledge out there about the basics and then we, the accountants have been really in close contact saying they've got a lot of that information they could make it quite easy you know, for farmers to kind of do it if the system was there. No, no, thanks for that. I think the key fundamental here with this question is um, what we propose in Hewaki Kanoa is we would work 
uh, as the heart of it as the system oversight board to ensure that that would happen. What the government's proposal is that they would do it through probably government departments. And, and I think that what you need to ask the question to yourself is, do you think the government could implement on its own a system by the 1st of January 2025? Mm -hmm. No, thanks for that time, Nick. Um, next question we've got there is, um, you know, um, how much revenue generated from levy would be returned to the farm gate as reward to farmers versus being absorbed in administration costs in setting up system R&D projects? I presume this is more around Hewaka Noa in comparison, but I'll get you guys to, you know, um, split them out if that's okay. Um, Nick, Roe? We yeah. Um, so what the partnership proposal said is that um, that uh, aside from research and development and administration, um, that all of the levy would be returned to the farm gate through incentives or sequestration, right? And, and we can't, we, we didn't go down to the detail of exactly what that looks like because that would be governed by that system oversight body that would have representation from farmers on it through sector bodies and other, and other avenues, right? So um, it would put us at the heart of control in terms of, and the transparency around that had to be 100% clear with farmers about how that was, the decisions were made, but it would put us at the heart of control around how that revenue was recycled and it wouldn't go outside the system. Um, so the intention was that uh, all of it, as much as possible, would return to the farm through incentives and sequestration minus that R&D and, and admin, obviously. Um, but uh, the level of detail was we didn't get that far uh, apart from talking about that system oversight board. No, thank you for that. Jim or George, anything to add to that? No, pr probably not really, I don't think. I think it's, it's probably pretty well explained. Okay, no, thanks for that. Um, question here for James. It's probably, um, I think James, he waited patiently, I think it's been about 50 minutes ago. Um, is net revenue metric from government modeling the same as operating profit? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, right. I, can, I think we would assume so, Simon. Yes. Yeah, we kind of assuming that they've done it, but who yeah. would? Yeah. Yeah. So, so what I can tell you, and we've got little bits around the model, and that's why the, we've kind of been drip fed bits, is that what we found out last night is net revenue for each sector is the aggregate of the economic farm surface of the farms within the model, but they haven't shown us the farms within the model yet, right? So. Okay. It comes from a Naki Fenua report. Okay. I think as well, maybe. Okay. Um, just, um, you know, a question up there, and it came back as your, your last point around the things around, um, you talked about Nick, was how would collectors actually work in practice? Yeah. So, so um, in terms of collectors, uh, they would have to be, and part of the setup is you have to establish a pathway for collectors to register and identify themselves and then be set up as obviously a way to collect, um, well, aggregate kind of farms within that. And then farmers would obviously have to choose whether to opt into that system or not. And remember that the Hewaki Kanoa partnership proposed that GST registered and some thresholds for farm, um, farm stock numbers and areas and nitrogen use to, to meet that threshold. So GST register and then your GST register would opt into that collective that was established uh, and then that collective would be responsible for reporting uh, a, a, and or offsetting or reducing emissions so the management of it would come from the collective instead of the individual farm i'm okay. um, still a lot of work to do of it obviously but it can be done okay no thank you for that um the question here that's come up the top now, has any simpler systems been investigated, e.g. payment, warming act packed in only by different sectors? So, you know, we've had this, he you know, we've got the government proposal, uh, people are saying, is there a simple, I think I've got, hope I've got this right, um, a simpler system's been investigated. Well, I'll have a crack at that, Simon, first up. Thanks, George. You know, through the process of Haywaka Ekenawa, you know, oh, a heap of different systems were looked at um, and a lot of them had benefits for different sectors and different things um, and on the, the downside a lot of them had disadvantages um, for, for others so you know what we came up with was what we thought was the 
sort of met, met the four pillars that we set out to achieve when we set the partnership up around equity and balance and um, achieving, uh, uh, meeting the, the targets that the government has set us. Um, so you definitely, we have looked at other systems and, um, you know, what we came up with was what we thought was um, the best um, to deliver um, on those those four pillars that were the original intention. No, thank you for that. Um, with that, um, this one comes up. Um, where is the GWP star number? Um, you know, and we've talked about it actually in the He Wakana proposal. Where is it in, I presume this is in the government proposal. Ro, I see you're nodding, so. So, so GWP star, um, we both, I think, Derry and ourselves um, us want a warming approach taken to reporting of emissions and in setting the targets and GWP star when we've had conversations with Dave Frame and Adrian Macy who are the New Zealand science leaders on this they say that GWP star is best used in terms of the targets um, and um, and then the way that we carry and, and we've got a split gas target so um, so we've got a separate target for methane in terms of the zero carbon bill at the moment which kind of reflects the science of GWP star and that you know the real point there is that it's a short-lived gas and it doesn't need to get to zero but it's got some of the principles there in terms of we've got a split gas and we've got a separate target but we don't agree with the target and we've still got to get that target um, reduced and the government's modelling that they've put out just reinforces how important it is that we get those targets reduced because it's shown that, you know, the higher the target, the higher the price and the prices have a big impact. And so we've really got to separately tackle that target. And then in terms of um, Hey Waka, the way that we've kind of reflected the fundamentals of that science is that we're not in the ETS. We can't be in the ETS because we've got a separate target um, and we've got a separate price for methane that is aimed at meeting that target. And if we could get that target to better reflect that GWP SAR science, get it down, um, you know, 10, you know, the GWP science suggests 10% by 2050 should be, you know, a more appropriate sort of target for no additional warming. Um, that would be the, the way to reflect it. We haven't taken it as far as the farm level because when you take it down to the farm level, it gets really, you know, you grandparent your existing emissions and you reduce from there. You've got equity issues with new entrants or Maori farmers, um, and it's really variable as well at the farm level. If you have a drought one year, you're a hero. The next year you're rebuilding your stock, you could face really high bills. So really want to use it in the targets. We want to report on warming, but at the farm level, it's a bit tricky. No. Maybe in the future we could do GWP star if we get, you know, 10 years, 12 years of data once we've kind of been doing this for a while. Okay. No. So, Simon, can I just yes. make another comment? Yes. Um, I think I think we just remind ourselves, like, um, I think the question's a really good one and it comes up. Remind ourselves we started on this journey because government have legislated that agriculture goes into the ETS. And so this whole process is about thinking about what's you know we just think that that's such a poor, potential poor outcome for new zealand and for and globally and so that's what started us on this journey to find a better construct rather than have agriculture go in the ets and the government have given us the opportunity to come up with a proposal which we did you know and so once if we can get that proposal that we originally proposed or i mean that looks a lot like it um implemented then at least we're fit for purpose going forward to continue to have these debates because there is a 2024 and 2029 where we're around the targets and the science around the stuff and the logic around this is evolving all the time to actually to Rena's point and so if we get this construct in place if our targets change or if the if the actual criteria around how they're calculated can change or if we can make those submissions and get some recognition of that then Haywalk Econo is fit for purpose to actually take that into consideration and I think that's an important point for us not to lose sight of things guys. So just checking that, um, Jim, you're saying this is a construct that actually can move with the science as it goes forward as we know more. 100%, exactly right. Okay. Yep. No, yeah, this, is, this is us putting it into the right construct that as we can continue uh, to actually have those discussions about the appropriate targets as the science of all the right ones, Fun Haywalk Economic can actually take all that into consideration. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, and we'll be using the GWP star science to, to make those arguments. 
Okay. Yep. No, thank you. Um, the question there, we've got to come back to collectives. It's a great one, actually, because um, for all collectives, as it currently stands in government, would a dairy plus support plots or multi farm owner, not attached, be able to submit as a collective? I think it's either a yes or no. Yeah. Um, so um, it's a maybe, actually, Simon. So if you have a, a, a multiple farm ownership, you could still could do it under one entity if it if they're all represented under the same GST number. The the issue that comes with multi farm ownership is often when you're trying to uh, you set them up as separate businesses and separate GST numbers because you want to control the expenditure and and know where things are going and and what individually they're doing. Um, so if they did have individual GST numbers, then no. If they had the same GST number, then yes. So it depends how you structure your business. But as a sub submit as a collective, not currently called a collective because only Māori farmers can enter a collective so that you could just enter it under the government proposal as one entity with one GST number if, if, you, had it, if you had your business set up that way. Okay, no, thank you for that clarification, Nick. Um, the next one probably for you actually, what farmers can do for better emission management? Jim, George, do you want to... I think it's worth, I'll just make a point and then I'll maybe hand it up to the technical guys unless George wants to add anything, is that if we look at, I think our, as a country, our total, if we go back to say 1990, you know, like the base year 2017, but if we go back to 1990, our total emissions have gone up. But as a sector, we've become more efficient because if we were farming exactly the same way as we were in, in 1990, our emissions would be 30% higher than they are today. And so our emissions are higher because we've grown as a total sector, but our efficiency continues to grow. And so, um, so I think that's something, you know, there's a direct correlation between um, feed eaten and, um, and methane produced, you know, but there are efficiencies that farmers can continue to improve, you know, better lambing rates, you know, more production per cow. So more of it goes into production and, you know, utilizing feed better all those things will add to efficiencies. And that's part of, for us, like this why for us, this is not just a pricing mechanism. This is a dis discussion also about farming and farming practices and, and what we can do to actually um, try and achieve the targets in the short term, at least, uh, without too much um, impact on the farms and potentially improve some productivity along the way. And the long term, of course, we're, we're, we're backing ourselves um, finding mitigations. Yeah. Can I just make, I know you're running out of time, so I'll just make a couple of points on kind of that. Uh, emissions reductions. Uh, firstly, uh, it is incredibly hard to reduce emissions because of methane is tied to dry mat intake and, and nitrous oxide emissions are generally tied to nitrogen surplus. But there are some things that, you, as Jim pointed out, around efficiency. Um, two resources that are really good. On the Hewaki you know, web page, there, um, there was a whole document put together around um, farm planning and options for farmers. Uh, that steps through in, in terms of looking at across all of agriculture about what you could possibly do. Uh, and, and also on the Ag Matters website, which is run by the New Zealand Agriculture Greenhouse Gas Research Centre, there's some really good videos and, and resources there for farmers. And the reason that I point to those things is that um, we know reducing emissions is hard and farmers, because of the uniqueness of their farm systems and climate, everybody will have different options. You can't blanket things across all of agriculture and say this will reduce emissions. It's it's very much a unique situation. So those two resources, and I'm sure um, Dion and Laura can chuck the websites in the chat, um, they're really good places to go and to explore more in terms of what you can do on farm to reduce emissions. Okay, look, um, great, look, it's 25 past. Um, I promise we're gonna finish at half past one, but we have time afterwards there to actually come back to some of these other questions of the people that can stay and ask personally. Um, look, thank you for that. Look, that's 25 minutes just flown by and we've answered 25, 30 questions. So I really appreciate the panel's input and the questions that you guys are given. So look, what I'll do now, I'd like to just hand over to George just to hand, outline the next steps. And then for those who want to stay on, we can come back to some of those uh, other questions as well. Yeah, thanks, Simon. And yeah, hello, everyone. And to those that don't know me, I'm sitting out on the coast of the Wairapa, uh, and this blue necklace is my uh, dog whistle, if you're wondering why I'm wearing a necklace. Hey, so I'm just going to uh, cover off uh, what sort of happens from here as far as the government uh, consultation process on, on their proposal and give, give you some timelines around that. 
And then, you know, what we need to do as farmers um, and, and responding to their consultation uh, and what some of our next steps are uh, before we wrap up. So can we go to the next slide, please? So the, the timeline that the government had set out for the emissions pricing um, is clearly uh, they're consulting uh, right now um, through until early December um, when the consultation um, uh, period will end. Uh, and so, you know, it's very important that, that we as farmers get involved in that process. And clearly um, your, your levy bodies are, are taking a lead in that. Um, and we've got a number of roadshow events, which will both be in person uh, and, and, and online. This is the first of those um online along online events but uh i think starting next week there will be uh in-person events around the country held by both dairy and Z and beef and lamb new zealand uh, as well as the government will be holding their own um uh, consultation uh program um which is somewhat more limited uh but there is options there to to get involved in that some other key, key dates that we need to think about uh, going forward is uh, one that we have been working on really hard as an industry is around all farmers needing to know their number uh, by the end of this year. And we, we've made really good progress for, for that. Um, through the dairy industry, obviously most of their, uh, their processing companies uh, provide the dairy farmers with their number and beef and lamb have been running a number of workshops around the country uh, and we're making really good progress to that and i think i heard rowena said rowena say we're at somewhere near 70 percent uh, of farmers knowing their number uh, now uh, in the sheep and beef sector and i know that the dairy sector ha has a number higher than that as well uh, in 2023 uh, so next year is essentially when the government proposes there's a development of the system and a pilot uh, and that is also when they're proposing they would make a decision whether to go to the backstop uh, of a processor levy, which we're obviously um, not in favour of, uh, but that is what they are proposing. Uh, and then 23-24 is the uh, you know, proposed registration for farmers into the system and you know, a pilot accounting of the system. We're not sure how that might work, uh, but that is where the, the proposal. And then the 24, 25, and I suppose we're talking about financial years uh, as we, you know, move into the multi-year. Uh, so from wherever, from May onwards in 2024 uh, will be when we start May for the, the dairy industry. I think that's your year and uh, generally July 1 for the sheep and beef sector. Uh, that's when we will need to start reporting our emissions from that point forward. Uh, and then essentially 1st of January 2025 is when the emissions themselves are uh, uh, supposedly going to be priced and, you know, we will be facing uh, levy tax uh, from that point forward, essentially. And my assumption is that, you know, it will be retrospective on your first year's um, reporting um, from, you know, uh, mid-2024. Uh, and so, yeah, also from January 25, um, you know, there's, uh, a there is a requirement from government that all farmers must have their plan, uh, sort of a farm plan, which will include their, um, their GHG number. So, yeah, that kind of gives a guideline on what the government's proposing. There's a lot to do. And, you know, understand that this is a very complicated uh, uh, topic and, and, and issue that we're all trying to grapple with. Um, so, you know, we need to all understand it. So just a bit more detail on how you can provide uh, feedback. Uh, so the, yeah, the final date for submissions is the 18th of November, and then obviously the government will uh, take a few weeks before they come back with a, a decision. Uh, so any feedback that we get from today and all of our um, uh, uh, consultation um, webinars or in-person in meetings will help to form both Dairy NZ and Beef and Lamb's own submissions. So obviously we'll both be providing a, a, a very comprehensive submission um, uh, on, on what we think is the best way forward. But we would strongly um, are wanting farmers to also uh, provide their own submissions and both Beef and Lamb and Dairy NZ will be uh, providing templates for those. 
Uh, I'm not sure if they're quite ready to go yet because we're working very quickly on this one. Um, but that is the, is the intention. And I know for a fact that um, the, you know, the meat industry, your processes will also have uh, ability or, and I'm sure the dairy, dairy processes will be the same, will give you information to help you and, and link you into providing, providing your own submission. And for those that are really keen and want to get really involved, you can supply them directly to the government uh, through the link there. Um, but it is crucial that uh, we as farmers submit and you talk about how the effect is for you on your own farm and your own personal situation and your own community and what the effects might be. Um, so that is very important. Next slide, which I think is, uh, yeah, so just some key messages that we wanted to get through uh, before I wrap up and we can take further questions when I'm finished. But this is quite different. The government's proposal was quite different to the Haywaka Okanoa partnership recommendation. Um, and so, and as such, you know, fundamentally, uh, we do not accept it. Uh, and it is no longer our proposal. This is the government's proposal. Uh, so we need to be really clear on that. Um, clearly, there was a couple of things in there that, you know, were good for the sector, uh, that the government feels like farm level is the way to go, uh, if not if not only in the short in the short term, but long term, uh, which we, we are in agreement with. And the, the, the split gas approach has been um, it has been agreed to, which is obviously crucial for the sector and the ability to revenue uh, any uh, income back to the sector, although we, that's probably not quite as strong as we would like uh, and was in our original pro proposal. Um, so yeah, overall, there's several key areas that they have changed that we are you know, really focused on highlighting to the government how that has tipped the balance, as we're calling it, uh, to make this, um, you know, pretty much inequitable for, uh, for, for, for the sector. So, yeah, can I just thank you all for taking the time out of your day uh, and engaging with us. It is a very important topic, um, and I know it seems to have been going on forever. Um, and could also thank um, all the team on the call today, um, especially, uh, you know, the teams within Dairy and Z and Beef and Lamb, who, you know, since the government's consultation has come out, have worked tirelessly, firstly understand it um, and, and, and sort of pick it down to actually what it does mean for us as farmers. Uh, and secondly, you know, uh, providing information and, and on how we need to respond and then getting together and, you know, very quickly putting in this uh, consultation sort of um, calendar that we've got ahead of us over the next two to three weeks. So thanks to them and I'll hand back to you Simon thank you oh, no thanks very much George and I know some people will have to get away as such um, but we will continue on we had a few more questions um, I know because there's a lot of questions because people the devil is in the detail um, and we also have the opportunity if people will do want to raise their hand that we can bring them on um, just to remember um, that actually um, um, do remember that you are recorded. So um, just um, somebody said, well, my friend is very passionate. They said, just make sure I remind me that I'm recorded, Simon, so I don't say anything I shouldn't. Um, but we're going to come, what we'll do, we'll tell you a couple of questions. If you want to put your hand up under the chat type stuff, we'll bring you in after a couple of questions. Um, quick ones, um, do we have a ballpark figure on the system creation cost? Any ballpark figures? Rowena, Nick? The government did some modelling um, for the creation of Hiwaki Ekanoa. It was about $90 million, Ro. Was that a sound about right? I did have to go back and have a read. Um, uh, but that was based on similar figures to set up the NZETS. Uh, the whole point of us being at the heart of, or the agriculture sector being at the heart of what we proposed in Hiwaki Ekanoa is to try and ensure that it didn't just bloat out to a, a, a large group in Wellington. Um, and that's what we were trying to avoid. Obviously, with the government's proposal, we're not part of that build anymore. It would be government build, so out of our hands a wee bit. Okay, no, for that, for Nick. Well, um, has the industry model potential impact on food inflation? Uh, this is a really hot topic globally in New Zealand today. Anybody take us for that? Ro? It's a really good question. We haven't done that. Okay. But it's a good question. Yeah, no, that's a really good question, you know. Um, um, oh, here's a question that actually, um, what is your main argument against ministers 
um, you know, having control on price. Uh, the government's question, um, Jim or George, do you want to have a crack at that? No, well, I think this is a genuine, we went into this as a genuine partnership. And and, and like we've said, you know, we take, try and take a balanced approach here, you know, because we don't, yes, you know, we want to play our part in New Zealand's commitment, but we have a view about, you know, because what we find is that as farming organisations, we're kind of closer to farmers and we know what works on farm and what farm, what options farmers have. And there are management practices like we talked about that farmers can implement. We think that's a much better approach than just having um, a, just a state um, pricing driver to actually try and, um, you know, try and drive the outcomes. And so we, we think we think having us part of that process will deliver better outcomes for our real communities and we'll still be after, um, you know, we'll still be you know, trying to meet our targets. And the other thing I will say, Simon, is this was a big um, thing for our farmers when we had our, our meetings in, in February and March. You know, farmers basically told us, like, you know, you're going to help the government put in place this levy and then you're going to basically let them set it wherever, wherever um, they want. And so we just basically said, well, look, in the spirit of the partnership, and that's the conversation we've had all the way through, we believe all the partners should collectively be working together to identify, you know, um, you know what, what levy rates should be set, you know, how that money should be allocated, what R&D should be funded, and what on-farm practices which should be incentivising and rewarding. Okay. Thanks for that, Jim. Anything to add, George? No, I think Jim's covered off pretty well, but I think it should be acknowledged that even in our original proposal, we were realistic in the fact that actually the final say was always going to land with the minister, but it was actually how they made that decision that was important. Um, you know, I think, you know, this is a government um, thing, so they always do have the final say, but it was kind of how the, the information that provided to them to make the decision was done, it was the important part. No. Thank you for that, George. Um, next one was actually that's a good, that's a good question. Like initial set cap was at um, if he walked know it was set at cap at eleven cents. Um, what government proposal and price? What is the government proposal and price? And how can I decide on the proposal if I don't know the price and forecast impact on my farm during consultation? I think this relates to the previous question a wee bit as well. What we proposed originally was a cap on methane prices at eleven cents. And that was to provide some assurance going forward, right? What the government proposed is, um, is quite a different model. Uh, the modelling that they did, and we only showed you the, the low cost, uh, they modelled at three prices, eight cents, 11 cents and 14 cents, right? Um, the key thing, difference here is kind of what Jim's just alluded to. We can't predict the price because that will be decided by the ministers on advice from the Climate Change Commission and the government's proposal, right? And that's why we could do a bit more modelling for the Heiwaki Canal proposal because the system oversight body, which would have an industry representation, was at the heart of how these decisions okay. were made alongside ministers and enhanced collaboration. So but, mm, can, unfortunately, can, I can't. Yeah. yeah. We can't give any guarantees, but one clarification, we said a maximum of 11 cents um, for that initial price. The positive thing about the modelling is that they're, their modelling shows that eight cents by 2030 would achieve the methane target. I mean, and that was kind of key to what we beef and lamb modelling we put out back in June was that we thought that the prices that the program office had modelled would were, were higher than they needed to, you know, to achieve um, the current targets that we don't sort of agree with. So I guess there's some positives in the modelling that the government's done that that it implies that. Um, they sort of agree that lower prices can achieve it. But like Nick and Jim are saying, you know, we don't know how that'll track over time um, and what sort of considerations they'll take into into account. Uh, well, narrower set of criteria that they'll take into account. Okay, no, thank you for that. Um, just checking in behind the scenes, have you got anybody online that wanted to answer a question directly to the panel? I'm hearing no. Okay, that's okay. If those want to just um, raise your hand and such. Um, the question, we've got next one here. Are you able to clarify what, what the exact on-farm mitigation tools are available and will be ready to deploy in 2025? Who wants to crack at that? Nickel Rowe? Yeah, I can, I can start. So, so there are some um, mitigations that are obviously in the research pipeline that are that are taking a bit of time, right, and and have been worked on, and um, but there are some that could uh, potentially 
closer and that's in the form of um, potentially some inhibitors that might be coming to, to market but uh, there's still a lot of hurdles to jump over for them right so and that was why it was important that it wasn't just based on those tools in terms of what we proposed it was also based on incentivizing change and looking at what you could do on farm and around efficiency as well um, the government's taking a much more linear approach in terms of just looking at a set of tools in terms of that incentivization so um and and, um, and and it signals to us that there's a lot of work to do obviously to find and provide tools to the industry to the to farmers uh, in a very short time frame right and just to build on that for the sheep sector we've obviously got um low methane sheep but you know the, the technology has only been around for a while and so we are looking to get funding to ramp up this you know the scalability of of that um by 2025 but it's going to be obviously limited by genetics those animals will have to be busy um the rams um but also i guess in terms of on-farm stuff we are also in, we're doing work on pulling together information about what's out there at the moment that does improve that efficiency. Um, we've got the Hill Country Futures Project as well that's looking at, you know, better legumes and, and grasses for Hill Country um, that can help for that. So the idea is to have you know, a lot of that pulled together. But like Nick said, you know, with that on-farm stuff, mm. there are things farmers can do and that could be if they're doing that stuff it might get reflected in the calculator by showing you've been you've produced it more efficiently and you pay you know slightly less but what we'd been sort of doing through the calculator is that you could get paid an incentive payment for doing that as well to make it a lot more attractive to do those things and and that's where they've really limited what farmers could get paid for and incentivize for doing some of those um, activities and therefore lower the costs for them. And that's quite a big, as you said, a real big difference between the government proposal and um, Iwakanoa. Um, this one probably for George and you, Jim, and actually, if we do all this, um, we deliver the outcomes for methane and nitrous um, emissions reductions, will the levy end? Um, I'm not sure it'll end, but our view at least is it should, like we said, we'll continue to debate what the right targets are and what the right, um, you know, and I guess the part we're paying those and, and see how we're tracking against those targets. But if we're on target, um, then I th we think then, you know, if, if we're playing our share when we're on target, there was, a, there, was a, there was a case that says that either one of two things should happen. Either the levy should be at a very low rate, because remember, we're still um, recognising sequestration and there's still some admin costs and things. You know, or if we're going to, if farmers potentially, if the mitigations are available and farmers potentially more than what they need to do to play their part, should there be some recognition of that where they get compensated for that or acknowledged for that? And so that's a discussion for another day. Yes. But, but our view at least is, you know, like this is this is a mechanism to, <laughs> to actually deliver the targets. And if we can do that and more, you know, which is always a possibility if, if we if we get, if you get the right mitigations come to market and we should have that discussion about what that means around the pricing and whether or not we get recognised for that. Okay, no, thank you for that, Jim. Um, it almost follows on the next question. Uh, what's the way forward, you know? Do we compromise, compromise to land on a farm system or delay to get the process delivery? Everyone seems to be reverting to corners. George, you want to have a crack at this one? Yeah, I'm not quite understanding the, uh, the question there, Simon. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you know, I think, uh, you know, it is a very difficult thing that we're thinking and that's why uh, getting it right is very important and that's yep. why we've been working for two years uh, on this and, um, you know, like Jim said with the previous question, I don't think we can ever believe that, you know, if we meet the target, it'll just stop. Yes. Uh, but for me, it's all around, if we're meeting the target, then it's a very low price. Um, and, and you know won't have significant impact on the sector, and that that's what is uh, is really important. And I think you know also just reflecting on the question around the mitigations, kind of we all know there's bugger all mitigations out there right now, and come 2025 there's still probably going to be bugger all. Um, so we need to reflect that within our system that actually yep. don't have a lot of options out there. Uh, and you know they're going to take time, uh, and we're hoping and relying that science will get us there. Um, but you know we need to make up sure the system is ready that that might not be on day one. Great, and it shouldn't put it shouldn't put farmers out of business 
in that interim period. Mm -hmm. And that, that speaks to really having that wider criteria around how levy prices are set, right? Okay. Um, just a quick question, it's just quick technical, quick, what models are being used for farm gate emission numbers at the moment? Um, Ro, Nick, do you want to? So, so obviously there's existing tools such as Overseer and Farmax and stuff like that, but the more recent tools that Ro um, talked about in terms of the beef and lamb calculator is a really good tool to, to look at um, your farm gate emissions. Also through your milk processing company, a lot of them are well, through Fonterra, they use their own model, the AIM model, which is an inventory model, which is pretty accurate, and, and other companies use Overseer as well. But there's a number of them, and they're, they're all kind of explained on um, uh, on the Ag Matters website as well. Just checking, and we've got no hands up. So nobody wants to talk to the panel directly. No, silence is golden. Um, um, We'll just got a question probably for you, Ro. Um, beef and lamb economic is um, six, 750 stock units. Was there any attempt made to go to this level rather than the 550 stock units? It's a really good question. I don't know the background to that threshold being chosen. Um, I don't know if anyone else, Nick, if you've got any knowledge around when that threshold was set and what that was used. Was so there's used? some thresholds. That, the reason the thresholds were set was to capture the majority of emissions. So those thresholds, I think, capture 97% of agricultural emissions. Um, we didn't want to get ourselves in a situation where we would be administratively burdened to cal calculate every little lifestyle block and things like that. So that's why there was a threshold set there. And I wasn't part of that conversation at that time. Um, yeah. So I couldn't probably say any more than that. No, look into it. No, thank, thank you for that. Um, probably Jim and George, like this, um, the Maori representation. This, um, you know, FOMO, who's at the table um, representing them as such? Uh, well, I'll, I'll have a start then, happy for George to actually add anything. So, FOMO are, of course, representing Maori interests as part as one of the partners to Heiwaki Kanoa. And my understanding is that they are consulting with their members and stuff as well. So, uh, but obviously not this forum, but they're holding their own meetings and, um, and and discussions with their members, as I understand it. So, so do you know, Rowena and Nick, do you know if that's, have you got anything to add to that? Uh, I, I understand the plan is being formulated at the moment around what that engagement might look like. Uh, I do know we're going to do some, some Māori hui's, um, but there is always the opportunity to come along to any of the engagement sessions. Um, yep. it's, it's, it's all inclusive. Yeah, so we're definitely wanting to make sure that we get good Māori representation at the meetings that we're holding around the country and working with Māori um, agribusiness leaders in some of the regions that we're going to, but also the government is, is doing quite comprehensive um, engagement with Māori through FOMA, I believe, and others um, on this proposal as well. Um, we've told from ministers that reason behind NZ um, New Zealand being the first country to be taxed in ag is for market excess. The panel's opinion, so it's a, your opinion. Um, what's the panel's, panel's opinion on this given the markets that we supply? Um, is it important that we're taxed in ag for, to, for our market excess per se? Oh, um, that time first. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think yeah, there is a clear signal um, from our international um, markets that, you know, a trend towards uh, low carbon production is what uh, they want. And that was shown in one of the slides that Jim spoke to um, around some of you know, the, the, the mega multinational companies. You know, they all have these uh, targets in place. Uh, but I re recently attended a roadshow um, with the Alliance Meat Company and the CEO described it as the, the government is probably well ahead of where the market is on this, um, you know, so we're running ahead. Um, but there's no doubt that there is a trend ac ac across the, the world that, that we're heading this way. Um, but, you know, as a lot of farmers are questioning, why do we need to have to be the, the absolute lead on this, um, given our size in the overall global market? So, you know, that's the question, um, but our, our government has a, a clear agenda around this. Um, so, yeah, that's that's what they're doing. Thanks, George. Jim, do you have anything to add from your opinion? No, I think 
George handled it pretty well. I would just say that, like, I think I think George is 100 right. I think our markets are not going to shut us out if we don't do this, you know. And I think because you know, but we've got, you know, we, we've got a very premium product that we all offer to the world, you know, and we always try and sell to the most valuable markets. And um, and so I think the way we think about it, like this is this is something that's coming up. If you said would if we didn't do this, would our markets shut us out of their markets? The answer is no. We, we're not aware of any markets where they would shut us out. Will they pay us a premium? Who knows? Um, but what we do know is we try to uh, position ourselves well. It's what you know. It's what we thought to think about is the New Zealandness of our products, our clean green image, the quality of our products, the safety of our products. This is just one of the category that gets added to that list where we try to position ourselves going forward. And so, you know, how much of that we would then collect in a premium? Would it support the premiums we're getting? Would it means we get better premiums? Who knows? Only time will tell, Simon. No, thank you for that. Um, look, just conscious we've just got a you know, few more um, questions to go. Look, if anybody, we haven't got your question, you can't see it there, do, don't be frightened to put up your hand and directly talk to the panel. Um, just touch on this one, how much of the 1.4 million hectares vegetable, woody vegetable, woody, ve um, I think it's ve uh, vegetative, woody actually, actually are eligible in the original proposal? I mingled all that completely. Ro, you can distill it for me. <laughs> A woody, a woody vegetable. Um, yes, it's kind yes. of it's kind of lunchtime. So yes, it is. <laughs> um, I don't know the exact figures of how much it would have. I said a significant portion would have been yes. eligible under the original, but then within that, I mean, our estimates of the pre nineteen ninety was that because of the stock exclusion requirement, yes. um, that a lot of the pre-1990 would not be eligible because a okay. lot of the pre-1990 is not fenced. Yes. Um, and therefore, I think we estimated maybe 10, 15% um, maybe is already fenced of, okay. of that pre-1990. Um, and, you know, um, uh, at the rates of 1.8 tonnes per hectare, um, you know, that's quite low. It wouldn't see massive uptake you know, um, it would be something that happened sort of slowly over time. If the sequestration rates are lower than that, it would be even lower uptake because the fencing, you know, stock exclusion could be stock exclusion for natural regions, but fencing would be a lot more costly than what you would get. Okay, no, thank you for that. I might carry you on because the next question is leading to the sheep and beef sector. Um, how can any system that has the kind of impacts on sheep and beef sectors that the both original, the Hiwaki Nara partnership and the government proposals have to be acceptable? Yeah, and, and that's where we were saying that the sequestration that we'd proposed under Hiwaka Okinawa made it a lot more equitable. It sort of, the sequestration, and if you look at the beef and lamb report that we did in June that we put out, we were saying the prices needed to be a lot lower than what the program and office had modelled and that they that the program office had modelled not the right impacts. Yes. Um, and so the price had to be lower, um, but sequestration also had to be in there as well and it was particularly the post 1990 more flexible arrangements and the smaller blocks um that were going to you know drive a lot of that benefit because we've got a lot of our farmers have just got so much that is not one meat you know the one hectare or it doesn't fit that sort of um square peg should we say yes. um so that was that was we estimated that at those prices, you know, around an eight cent, you know, you needed to have something down around there, but you also needed the sequestration to be covered as well. Um, and that would bring it into a more equitable line. No, thank you. George, anything to add? Yeah, I suppose, you know, we, we're very focused and, you know, as we highlighted uh, when the release of the Haywen model, um, that price is going to be very important to our sector. Uh, and that we, you know, we won't be accepting anything that, you know, that puts our sector at risks. And, you know, the government's modelling, own modelling has shown us, you know, how sensitive uh, we actually are to that, uh, especially, um, you know, when you add in the afforestation effects that are happening to our sector um, sort of outside of, of this proposal. So, uh, yeah, it's very important to us and we're very focused on it. Right. Thanks, George. Um, look, we'll make this the last question unless there's somebody online wanting to ask a burning question. Um, 
and it came up, um, how was the nitrous oxide price modelled in the original proposal, the Hiwaki NOAA versus the government proposal? And Nick, I think you touched on this. Yeah, so um, the nitrous oxide price was modelled to be based on uh, paying for the components of uh, the system, right? It was the sequestration price that was proposed to be linked to the NZETS to provide that reward for on-farm sequestration and nitrous oxide would be priced to cover that cost and then a portion of the incentives and administration and R&D alongside methane. But this nitrous oxide was proposed, pro primarily proposed to um, cover the sequestration cost and the sequestration cost would be um, priced at a world link to the NZETS at a discount. And that was because it's obviously, um, it's obviously offsetting and, and sequestering and capturing carbon, right? So. No, thank you for that. Look, um, look, it's just a couple of minutes to two o'clock. Um, look, thank you all very much for your time um, staying online. Um, still got over about half that stayed online and have gone away. Look, um, thank you to the panel, Jim, George, Rowena and Nick and people behind the scenes for putting this together. Look, we've answered lots of questions. Um, I know there'll be lots of questions still coming. Um, I know a few people last time went on multiple um, webinars or came to events in person because there is it's the devil in the detail and actually how it um, impacts around this. Um, George made that really valid point at the end, look, look, get involved, make submissions, give feedback because it's all part of the, the submission process that these guys actually require. So look, I'll, I'll leave it there. Mm -hmm. Look, I'll just go to each of the panel. Any final word? Um, Nick, anything? No, I'll leave that to Jim. <laughs> oh, Verena, I'll, I'll... No, Jim, go Jim. <laughs> Okay, then I just, just want to thank everybody for coming on board. A lot of great questions. Like, I think George already made a comment, you know, great job. The team's been working really hard. I think no one should underestimate how much hard work these guys are doing. The, the information has been trickling out. And so we've, we've, um, we've been analysing it as it's become available. And these guys have been working overtime to firstly sort of understand the detail around this, because the devil is in the detail and then been working hard to get this presentation right and get ready for this so we can present to farmers because we know that you're, you were keen to engage. So I really want to thank the team first, but then also really thank everybody who participated in this. A lot of good conversations, a lot of good discussions. So we really do appreciate and support George's comments first. We really encourage you to continue to be engaged in this. Thanks, guys. No, no, no final word, George? Oh, yeah, just thanks for everyone for engaging with us and, you know, um, get into your community and tell people to get involved. This is really important for our sector. And I know right at the moment, it's pretty scary, for, especially for the, the, the dry stock sector, sheep and beef farmers. They're seeing in the newspaper and on the news every day that one in five of them's going out of business. Appreciate that's not a great thing to be reading about your sector. So yeah, get involved. And you know we are working really hard on your behalf to get a better outcome on this. Thank you. Yeah. No, thanks, George. Like for the rest of everybody, um, have a late lunch. We'll know that you're back on back to on farm. Look, appreciate your time. Um, we'll see you later. Take care, guys. <laughs>